Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com slash howshemoms. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. It's mid-November, 37 days until Christmas. Maybe you've already got your Christmas tunes blasting, but I bet Beth Millward beat you to it. Honestly, I often start playing Christmas music in August. It's still like 80 or 90 degrees, but once the kids like walk off to school, I'm like, I got to turn on a Christmas song. If I don't start like the first day of school, the first chilly day of the year, which most people think like fall and pumpkin and Halloween, I kind of just like fast forward. And I think like snowflakes and snowmen and Christmas music. Beth loves Christmas and it boggles her mind that anyone could look at the impending holidays with anything but glee. She has a theory about this. Why would you dread Christmas? It's so fun. You know why? This is why I stand by this belief. People who dread Christmas do not start celebrating it until after Thanksgiving. And so then it's that compact amount of time and it's like, ah, 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 so many things. I have to feel all the feelings. I have to do all the things. I have to do this and that. I've been celebrating it since August, people. What do I have to stress about? I've got like four months of celebration and you fools have 30 days. This is the How She Moms podcast, where we talk about how different moms solve the same problems. I'm Whitney Archibald, a mother of five kids myself. I collect ideas so you can pick and choose what works for you and your family. Christmas is coming, portly goose and all, whether that fills you with glee or stress. Today we're going to dig into this dichotomy and hopefully get rid of any dread you might feel. Christmas should be a season of joy and dare I say peace, even for moms. Fear not, you too can enjoy Christmas, though maybe not as much as Beth. We're going to start this episode the way I usually do, by talking strategy. You may know by now that one of my greatest joys is to find two moms with totally different strategies for the same scenario. In this case, celebrating Christmas. Let me introduce you to Beth and Siri. One way to characterize their two strategies is that Beth has an and approach to Christmas, and Siri has more of an or approach to Christmas. Let's look at a typical Christmas Eve at Beth's house so you can see what I mean. Buckle up. Okay, Christmas Eve. We start with Christmas Eve breakfast. And that was something from my family. We would call over like our aunts and grandparents or whatever, and then find people like at church that maybe didn't have family in town or, you know, something. Maybe they just didn't have a lot of people around. My husband's family does a sugar cookie decorating contest. So we incorporated that into Christmas Eve breakfast. And then we call an impartial judge over, usually a neighbor, to judge the cookies. This is very serious. We make up a bunch of categories. And then we have an award ceremony for the cookies. And that's super fun. And then we just do like last minute Christmas shopping, if there's any of that. And then the Christmas Eve dinner cooking begins. Basically, it's just eating all day. So my husband's family, I did Christmas Eve breakfast. He did Christmas Eve dinner. Neither of us wanted to give it up, so I just said, okay, I'll just do it all. His Christmas Eve dinner involves shrimp and crab and ham and all the side dishes. And so we start cooking, and then we have our big feast, and that's always yummy and delicious. And then we go drop off our 12th day of Christmas gift, and that's usually when we go drop off like the, our secret Santa For sure, we try to get our kids to come along with that. Then we do the nativity and Danny or my dad or his dad, whatever, whoever's there that year usually reads it. My kids all act it out. Then we open up Christmas jammies and a Christmas ornament for something that happened that year. So if they took piano lessons that year, they'd get a little piano. Or if we went to New York, maybe they'd get a Statue of Liberty My kids love that. That's probably, as far as gifts, always their most memorable gift. And then we put it on the tree. And then have you ever watched like the um, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, I don't know how many years ago, put out like the Nativity movie? And then you put Breath of Heaven by Amy Grant with it at the same time. So they line up perfectly and we snuggle up in front of it. 
we push play and then we try really hard to talk to the kids to be like, you know why we really have Christmas? Like that is really the story of Christmas. And we love all this other fun, magical stuff, but that's what it's really about. Like we try really hard to kind of like bear testimony or talk to them about that. But I usually start crying because I'm just too tender about Christmas. And so we like talk about that. And then we read the night before Christmas and then tuck them all in in their little jammies and they're all so excited to go to sleep and they can't wait till morning and I'm so excited and everyone's so excited. And of course we have to leave cookies and cookies for Santa, carrots for the reindeer, milk. And then yeah, if there's other things that come up, I mean, maybe you have to go caroling on Christmas Eve or maybe you have to go to a retirement. You, you don't know. Anything could happen. And then we all figure out which section of the house we're sleeping in. We always sleep together on Christmas Eve and then we put the kids to bed and then we come down and sleep with them later. Phew. I adore Beth, but thinking about packing all of that into one day makes me hyperventilate. But as you can tell, Beth loves it. That's Christmas to her. She packs it in not out of duty, but sheer exuberance. I'll share even more of her fun traditions throughout this episode. And yes, there are more. Also, you may have recognized Beth's voice. She's one of the three hosts of a favorite podcast of mine, Family Looking Up. If you haven't already, give it a listen. For some of us, the key to a stress-free Christmas is more of an or strategy. This is true for Siri Payne, a life coach with an organizational bent. So if you set your priorities, you set your intention for the season, then you only allow those things in that will allow you to hit those priorities. Like my focus is to create memories. So if I want to create memories, what am I doing during that season? What are the, some of the things on my calendar that I can attend that are going to create memories? I like to foster and cultivate family time rather than like the hustle and the bustle and everyone's gone and going here and there. It's like, is it going to create family time? Is it going to cultivate that? Create downtime and not to feel so rushed. Sometimes I feel like people have so many things to go to that, that Christmas is exhausting. Then the spiritual aspect of the season, that's what is important to us and our family. So are some of the things we're doing going to add to the spiritual aspect of the season, the true meaning of why we celebrate it? Are we providing service to other people? then those would be activities we would want to keep in. Um, and then also we just honor some traditions of the past. Some of the traditions that you have taken with you maybe as a child, and is that if that's still important to you and you've decided that you want to honor that tradition, then are these activities honoring a tradition? Then if something does come up that maybe you're like, I should go, everyone's going to be there. If it's going to take you away from your family or not allow you to feel great, or, you know, it just doesn't hit your priorities, then it's, a lot easier to be like, you know what, that might be really awesome, but I'm not going to do it this year. And you don't have to feel guilty and you don't have to feel stressed and overwhelmed that you're not making it to every party or that mm -hmm. you're not doing every cookie exchange or whatever. But if that, if making connections and being with your friends is on your priority list, then of course, like maybe a cookie exchange would be something you'd want to attend. So I think if you really define how you want to feel and what you want to accomplish, then if it's not in that category, then it's so easy to let it go and be off. So because of the organization, I really do feel like I get to enjoy the season the way that I want to enjoy it and the way that I think my family will benefit from the season rather than keeping up with everybody else and all the shoulds and all the have tos and really just simplify the season based on your priorities. And then you get to enjoy it so much more. But Siri doesn't just cut things out willy nilly. She talks to her kids about it and they make the decision together. This has been really enlightening to her. She discovered that sometimes she projected her own expectations on her kids, and she thought they cared about things they really didn't care about, especially when they realized there were trade-offs. One example of this is when they were deciding whether to put Christmas lights up. We asked them, okay, well, we, we have two options. We can either take the Saturday and everybody come outside and we help do it. And, you know, we kind of talked about what that would look like and what that would require of them. I said, or there's companies that we'll put them up for you. And so we can pay for this service and it's going to cost, I think it was like $600. And oh, wow. I said, so that would just mean that we will just have like a little bit less Christmas. So if you all were willing to give up one or two presents, then we'll, we'll take that money and do lights. And that's when they're like, Nope, we don't need the lights. Cause they didn't really want to spend the time doing it, nor did they want to like sacrifice a present at Christmas. As my kids are older, I've been able to say, okay, what means like Christmas to you? Like what says Christmas? What smells are Christmas? What do you look forward to? And so then each girl then was able to come up with like three or four things that they really thought, okay, this means Christmas. This says Christmas. These are the traditions that they've enjoyed. 
And then those are the ones we kind of kept and the ones that everyone's like, Hey, it's all right. Like, I don't care if we really have that. I don't care if we do this activity. Then what we realized is there were some things we were just doing because we thought that they meant more or that they were appreciated or that they were part of the Christmas were really, it doesn't, it's not really something that they are looking forward to or something that they found as like, kind of like that necessary part of Christmas. And so it's easy to cut those things out when you know what they are and what people really enjoy. Another way Siri has simplified is by ordering Chinese food on Christmas Eve rather than cooking up a big feast. They all love Chinese food, so they still look forward to the tradition. But this way, she gets to enjoy being with her family instead of hustling and bustling in the kitchen. This hustle and bustle is what seems to be behind most of the dread that the moms I talk to feel about the Christmas season. I love Siri's approach to edit your schedule to the most essential, most important things. But only you know if you're the kind of mom who is happier when you fill every minute with Christmas activities like Beth, or if you need to scale back and simplify this year. Both ways work, and so does being somewhere in the middle. Another culprit for Christmas stress is that dirty word, expectations. Sometimes as moms, we feel like we're in charge of making everyone's Christmas great. We want it to be so magical and amazing that sometimes we get unrealistic and then disappointed. But we're moms, which means by definition, we have kids. And when kids are involved, some things are just going to go wrong. One infamous Christmas Eve, my husband David was so sick that he was just down and out, asleep on the couch for the entire night. We ate our Christmas Eve dinner without him, and then tried to revise him for the pageant, but he was just out. We carried on without him, me reading from Luke and trying to direct the children and throw some songs into it. But pretty soon, it was just utter chaos. It ended with my five-year-old shepherd marching back and forth in front of the manger, chanting, Defense! Defense! In those moments, you just have to choose laughter. I found that often the expectations are mine alone. The kids are fine. If something falls through, sometimes as moms we feel personally responsible. But often we forget that Christmas can be fun for our kids and us too. One podcast I listened to recently really drove this home for me and gave me my mantra for this Christmas season. Participate. Here's Sarah Powers, co-host of the fabulous podcast, The Mom Hour. I want to be in my family instead of buzzing around them. And by family, Mm. in this case, I mean like the nuclear five of us, Brian and I and the three kids, because for so long, it just required a lot of management to make sure everybody had the right food or was not going to have a meltdown. And so you get really good at that. We've talked about that, how you get really good at anticipating all the potential issues and sort of navigating that. But then what happens is you sort of forget how to like literally just hang out and chill with your family. So yeah. I think the holidays are a nice kind of invitation to be like, oh, okay, I really could sit and read a book right now. Or I could make myself hot chocolate and sit with the kids and be a participant in it and not just. And it's not that like I have been so um, self-depriving the last several years. I found I have found ways to treat myself, but it's usually separate from the kids. If you think about it, it's like you escape for a girl's night or you escape for a date night or you wait till they're all in bed. And now that they're older and we can genuinely do things as a family, I find myself on autopilot kind of buzzing around and and just making sure things are done. And I don't have to do that anymore, but it takes retraining. And so I think that's it's just a general intention for this month is to do the things my family is doing and do them with them and and really be a participant. I just love this plan and I'm going to really try to follow Sarah's advice. I'm going to play the games and drink the cocoa. I really recommend listening to this whole episode. Sarah and Megan talk about several of their holiday goals. It's from last year and it's called December Intentions for Busy Moms. I'll link it in my show notes. For the rest of this podcast, I'm going to share some of the great ideas I've collected from moms, including more from Beth and Siri, in lots of different categories, from gifts to traditional activities to decorations to service. This is not intended to stress you out with even more activities and traditions to add to your list. It's just a fun glimpse into a variety of family traditions to show you how different Christmas can look from one family to another. And who knows, you may find one or two that you want to throw into yours. Let's start with one of the traditions that has the potential to cause stress. Gifts. This is another of those categories where you can have an and strategy or an or strategy. Some families go hog wild just mounding those gifts under the tree. Others set a budget and stick to it. Still others set parameters based on categories of gifts. My friends Lori and Sam Brescia give their kids three gifts for Christmas, representing the three wise men. 
They wrap them in color-coded wrapping paper. Red is a gift of meaning, such as a journal, a scrapbook, a special date with mom and dad, or a family trip. Gold is a gift of wonder, something fun the child has been wanting. Green is a gift of usefulness, such as clothing, books, camping equipment, or a jewelry box. Having these limits helps them stick to just three gifts per person, and it keeps the focus away from the commercial side of Christmas. Siri uses different categories. We created a theme where they have something to read, something to wear, something to play with, or like something to entertain them, something to keep them warm, which could be as simple as like socks, pajamas, a sweater, a scarf, something that sparkles. I do have three girls, jewelry or makeup or something with sequins, you know, just as they get older, this, the sparkle changes and then something that's necessary. So if you just say, okay, these are the themes I want to do for my kids. And maybe you say two things that they play with and two things they read. Like, I don't know how many presents you want to give your kids, but I really feel like there is a true overload and they get too many things that allows them to not feel as grateful as they would like them to be when they have too many things. Lindsay Nielsen of the wonderful Instagram account, The Lindsay Report, has her own formula. One gift for mom and dad, one from Santa, something educational like a book, science kit, or something like that, and an experience such as a movie date, dinner date, mini golf, etc. When Julia was growing up, her dad planned a treasure hunt each Christmas for one big family present like a trampoline, a puppy, or, when they were older, a stash of gas cards and restaurant cards, always a big gift they could all use together. He would hide clues all over town, at the gas station, friends' houses, the grocery store, etc. Now that Julia has her own kids, she has continued the tradition, although they stay around the house since the kids are small. Typically, after all the presents have been opened, they point out an envelope that is sitting on one of the branches of the Christmas tree. Inside is their first clue. The clues always rhyme and are typically four lines long. Although one year when their kids were really young, they did pictures of objects around their home that they could find. After the kids find all the clues, it leads them back to the Christmas tree where their surprise is waiting. Isn't that so much fun? Plus, it helps stretch the gift opening part so it's not just over in a flash of wrapping paper. Most families I talk to also make sure that kids open presents one at a time so they can pause and be grateful along the way instead of just opening everything at once. Then there's the issue of Christmas lists. When I was a kid, one of the first signs of Christmas was getting those gigantic tree-killing catalogs from Sears and J.C. Penney, the wish books. We'd pour through them and star the things that we really wanted. Many versions of these still come to our house each Christmas, and the wants just start piling up. Of course we want to buy our kids things that they will treasure, and it makes sense to ask them what they want, but lengthy Christmas lists always leave me so depressed and worried I'm raising entitled children. In fact, I usually just skip the Santa letters for this reason, even though they're often pretty cute. One of my favorite solutions for this problem came from the podcast Happier with Gretchen Rubin. One of her listeners, Miriam, has her kids write a list of things they like, their interests and their hobbies, instead of a traditional wish list of items. That way, they don't feel entitled to get what they have put on their list or disappointed when they don't, but they give parents and grandparents a good idea of what interests them at the moment. Miriam saves these lists every year, and their family has fun looking back on what they have liked in the past. Beth has another genius solution, which solves several problems. When we'd ever be in the store, they'd always say, I want this, I want this, I want this, I want this. Can I get, uh, uh, uh. And I was, I just started taking pictures. I'm like, okay, hold it up and smile. And so then they'd hold up the thing at the store they say they want. And then they, it like put them at ease. Like, okay, mom's going to remember that this is what I want. And then it helps. I just would flip through the pictures. And then sometimes as we get closer to Christmas, if we've been to the store several times, I like sit down with them and I'm like, Hey, do you still like this? And half the time they're like, no, I don't want that. Or yeah, they can kind of review all the things they begged for. And then I don't know, like it put my kids at ease. Cause I felt like I was trying to fight them out of the store. And they were like, what if you forget? What if you don't remember? I really want this. And they were all panicky about it. And so I'm like, Hey, let's just take a picture. And then I'll always remember. And they were like, oh, okay. Allison Malstrom, my sister-in-law, keeps a gift list on her phone that she manages all year long and buys gifts throughout the year when she sees things on sale. Her goal is to have 90% of Christmas gift shopping done by early December each year. And your kids aren't the only people you have to shop for. I asked the How She Moms Facebook group what they do for extended family gifts, and I got a mixed bag. Some with larger families pick names or pick which family they'll buy for. Others buy for everyone, or at least every family, and some forgo gifts altogether. Buying for parents is often the hardest of all because often they've already bought or acquired the stuff they need or want. Hillary Hess's dad had a great solution. 
last year for Christmas, my dad said, instead of purchasing me and your mom presents, which was hard not to do, <laughs> you know, cause you're like, Oh, I want to give you something physical yeah. for Christmas. But he, you know, they said, we want you to go and spend X amount of dollars on doing service. And then I want you to report back to me what you did. And it was really amazing to be able to do that. And they loved just having us report back the things that they, that we did in their name, you know, for, for giving for Christmas. Marilyn came up with a great tradition for buying gifts for her grandchildren. She tells them the price range and then takes them each shopping, individually or in pairs, to pick out their gifts. She gets to spend time with them and find out what interests them, and she knows she's getting them something they'll actually like, and something that fits. Then the kids come home and wrap their own presents and bring them to the family room. They have a family party with dinner and other activities, and everyone opens their gifts. The kids love opening these presents as much as if they didn't know what they were. And it's fun for them that their parents don't know what the gifts are, and they get to surprise them. Most families I talked to have their kids buy gifts for each other, often with their own money, so there's some sacrifice involved. My sister Haley's four kids are still eight and under, so she gives them each ten bucks, and they draw names and buy for each other. She takes them all shopping together and just puts a blanket in the cart and hides the gifts underneath it as they pick them. One of Linda Crawford's favorite traditions is that her husband takes each of her four kids out to dinner and a shopping date for their sibling gifts. She loves watching them think about what their siblings truly want and need, saving up, and gratefully accepting gifts from each other. Not surprisingly, Beth has a really fun and very involved tradition for her kids' gift giving. Santa's Workshop. I made up all these little Santa dollars, so it's like a dollar bill with Santa's face in the middle. And I have like hundreds of them. And each kid has to earn 10 per sibling. So my kids have four siblings, so they each have to earn like $40 throughout the month. So we usually try to start that pretty early in the month to give them time. And it is nice, just those extra little chores. They do a ton the first day every year as soon as I post Santa's workshop and bring out the Santa bucks. And I have a, like, I just stick like an envelope on the wall for each of them. And I just take it out of Santa's bank and put it right into their envelope. So they're collecting their own money and they count it every once in a while and say, oh, I got $10, only 30 more to go or whatever. And then I just have a Santa's workshop paper already printed out that just has all the prices. So every time you clean the toilets, it's three bucks. Every time you clean out the car, it's a buck. And they could just do whatever they want on there as many times as they need to until they have all their money. And then closer to Christmas, we have a workshop set up. So like there's a page room, a Carson room, a Caden room, and each kid's come shopping. So we used to take them to the store and they would buy gifts for each sibling, but we are finding that it was getting a little chaotic. So Danny and I just go shopping for like, so I buy five things I know Paige would love. And then Caden comes in with his Santa bucks and Danny dresses up like Santa Claus. He has like a Santa hat on and they go shopping and then they have to come to Santa's cash register and beep and give us their Santa dollars to buy Paige a gift and Caden a gift and Carson a gift. So they've all picked gifts for each other with their Santa bucks at our Santa's workshop. And then there's neighbor and friend gifts. Linda Crawford likes to assemble ready-to-make rice side dish recipes from Paula Dean. She wraps them beautifully, and then she can just drop them off when the moment presents itself. No one has to refrigerate anything, you can use it anytime, and it doesn't add to the amount of treats on everybody's countertops. Instead of neighbor gifts, Kristen Steele's neighborhood has an open house in early December, and they bring donations for the food bank. It's another event to attend, but it's a fun one, and they all agree to support a good cause instead of exchanging gifts. Siri has a great idea for an early neighbor gift. So what I've always done is like on December 1st, right around the very beginning of the holiday before it gets super busy, I will do gift boxes or a roll of wrapping paper. And then it generally just says a little something to help you get wrapped up in the holiday spirit. And it's not food, which I feel like there's lots of traditions around food and lots of maybe unhealthy foods. And so I've always, no matter what I've given, it's always not been edible just because a, it doesn't then contribute to, you know, the extra calories that maybe people don't want to consume, but we do anyways. <laughs> or also then it doesn't limit like when I have to give them out. Like if you make fresh baked cookies, it's like they need to be given out within the day or two or then they're no longer a yummy treat. And so if you do something that's not edible, then it can be given out, you know, as you have time. The really cool thing, I hope my neighbors aren't listening, is I buy it after the Christmas season. So I buy it at 50% off. And so right now I have, we have a Christmas closet in our home and that Christmas closet is full of wrapping paper and the really cool, awesome gift boxes that maybe you would never buy for yourself. 
Hold up. Did she just say Christmas closet? We have this little like six by six room that just happened to be there like a closet. And so we actually put a lock on it. So we call it the Christmas closet. And um, that's where I store things for Christmas. So I put a box with every kid's name on it and including like we have family in Arizona. So there's like an Arizona box that's going home to Arizona and then all of the kids names. So as I start buying the gifts, I put them in their box. And then when it comes time to wrap all of the gifts, they're just right there. You don't have to resort and wonder what's there and what you need. And of course, you're not done once you buy the presents. Now you have to wrap them. Siri has a fun solution for this, too. I really love buying gifts and I really love thinking about it. And I really feel like I'm a great gift giver, but I hate wrapping it. Like if I could just give it to you under my shirt here, happy Christmas or happy birthday, whatever, you know, but I hate to wrap it. So one thing that I started doing with my husband is a couple of Fridays early on, we'll take date nights where I would just get out, you know, two pairs of scissors and two wrapping paper rolls and two tapes. And we put on a fun Christmas movie, maybe get a bowl of popcorn and we just wrap gifts. And so I literally can just give them a box like one of the boxes of the girls and just be like, Hey, everything you're wrapping is for this child because it's just the box. So we don't have to be like, Oh, whose was that for? I don't know. And I'm not sure. Cause sometimes as I had three girls, I had three in three years. So sometimes they all got the same thing or very yeah. close to it. And then it would be like, Oh, I don't know who got one and who didn't. So the, the birth or the Christmas box has been super helpful in that regard. And then we just go to town on Friday nights, a couple of Fridays and we just, get them all done watching a Christmas movie and then they are wrapped. And then I get to enjoy a looking at them under the tree. I think that's always fun. As the season goes on, you get a few more presents every, you know, couple of Friday nights. And then I'm not doing that on Christmas Eve or like when they're finally out of school and I can have the opportunity to be intentional and hang out with them. I'm not like locked in a room going, go away. I'm wrapping the presents. You can't come in here. One of the best Christmas presents my husband and I have ever gotten each other is a subscription to Audible, which is one of the reasons I chose them to sponsor my podcast. I had always wanted to read books together so we could talk about them, but David couldn't find time to read. So now we pick several books a year to listen to together. I love it so much. Today's book recommendation is The Wright Brothers by David McCullough because it was the first one we listened to together. If you haven't already experienced Audible, now's a great time to start. Audible is offering listeners of the How She Moms podcast a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com slash howshemoms. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash howshemoms for your free audiobook. Another of the Christmas traditions that you can prep ahead is Christmas cards, if that's one of the things you've decided is important. We always order ours during Black Friday sales, but it usually takes me until right before Christmas to get them all addressed and sent. One of the cards I look forward to receiving every year is from my friend Adrienne Mortensen. She asks a different child to write the family Christmas letter each year, summarizing the year and or describing each family member. Other family members are not allowed to comment or edit what is said about them, within reason of course. It's pretty hilarious every year. Jansen Bradshaw hates throwing away all the beautiful Christmas cards she receives after she's done displaying them over the holidays, so she decided to save them each year and cut them into heart shapes. Then she ties the hearts together to make a Valentine's Day garland. We did this last year, and I loved it. I'll include a photo of it on Instagram this week and on HowSheMoms.com in the post for this episode. Jansen is the wonderful woman behind EverydayReading.com, one of my go-to sites for Christmas book recommendations. My cousin April Gilbert has a special Christmas tree set up just to display the Christmas cards she received. A great idea and a great segue into talking about ornaments. I received a lot of listener ideas about Christmas tree ornaments. Several families buy ornaments when they travel or let each kid pick an ornament that reflects their interests each year. Some have both a kid tree and a pretty tree because of course those kid ornaments can get pretty gaudy and random. My favorite ornament tradition is one I discovered and promptly copied six or seven years ago from my friend Amber Adams. I walked into her house and noticed a cell phone dangling from one of the branches of her Christmas tree. Of course I asked her about it. She told me it was the cell phone her husband used to talk to her during their long-distance engagement. I looked closer and found more strange ornaments, a name tag she wore during her church mission, her husband's military name tag, a binky to commemorate her son's first Christmas, and the hood ornament from the beloved van that they drove into the ground. 
Because of Amber, our tree now includes my baby booties, my second son's first pair of glasses from when he was an infant, a metro pass from when my husband lived in Austria, a belt buckle from my hometown, some of the cheap necklace pendants my kids have bought me in Christmases past, and my high school ID card, among other mementos. I love that our tree is now full of family stories that we get to retell each year as we decorate and whenever visitors notice them. One year, my sister-in-law, Allison, gave us a gift of 25 ornaments that related to 25 New Testament scriptures with links to videos we could watch as well. We love bringing these out each night leading up to Christmas to help us focus on the meaning of Christmas. Now that our kids are getting older, we also use a guide that Brooke Romney, a fabulous writer, put together. It includes scriptures for each day of December, but it also includes really thoughtful questions that generated great conversations last year. Here's an example of some of the questions from one of the days. By who and how were the wise men warned not to return back to Herod? Did they obey the warning or question it? Have you ever been warned about a bad situation? What did you do? Were you like the wise men? I loved how thoughtful all her questions are. She is a master at questions. I'll link to Brooke's advent in my show notes. She also has great gift lists for boys, since she also has four boys, so I'll link to those as well at brookromney.com. One of the best parts about putting this episode together was finding out about unique family activities and traditions. I'll start with one of my own Christmas traditions with my siblings, which was short-lived, thank goodness, but very memorable. We were just finishing Christmas Eve dinner in 2001 when my two brothers gave each other the signal. They launched a coordinated attack, plucking me right out of my seat. Before I realized what was going on, they carried me kicking, writhing, and yelling to a rolling chair, to which they quickly and very securely tied me up. I was the Christmas hostage. They got right to work with decorations. Soon I was decked out like a Christmas tree, ornaments and candy canes dangling from the ropes, garland draped here and there, a hard hat for some reason, and a wreath around my neck, complete with lights. My husband of two years just stood idly by while they decked me out. Then my brothers picked up the chair, loaded me into the neighbor's van kidnapper style, and the whole family piled in. Since I was the second Christmas hostage, it had already happened to one of my sisters, I knew what came next. They would be leaving me on various doorsteps, ringing the doorbell, and running away, leaving me to sheepishly explain why I was disrupting their Christmas Eve festivities. After the first drop, I asked them to at least do me the courtesy of gagging me so I didn't have to have an awkward doorstep conversation. I have a video of one of the drop-offs, so I'll put that on Instagram and on HowSheMoms.com. So my two sisters and I each had a year of being the Christmas hostage, and then we stopped being able to get together for Christmas. Maybe one of these days we'll all get together again, and we'll have to take down our brothers. The Hansett family has a fun twist on the tradition of Christmas jammies. They draw names and buy pajamas for each other, each trying to find the funniest PJs they can. The one stipulation is that they have to wear them all year, or at least all season. They've come up with some pretty great pajamas. I have a picture of them, too, that I can post. Every Christmas, Elisa Stacy prints out tickets that say the Honda Express, and then she picks a night to drive the family around to look at Christmas lights. The kids have no idea what night it will be. They put them to bed as usual, and then they wake them up with a train whistle and give them their tickets, which they punch on their way out to the van, where hot cocoa and cookies await. They drive around and see Christmas lights and sing Christmas songs. So nice. Before kids, Danielle and her husband used to go out for breakfast to celebrate Christmas Adam, which is the day before Christmas Eve because Adam came before Eve. They tried to continue this tradition after having small kids, but they discovered it was not the way to say Merry Christmas. Now they celebrate with a fancy restaurant at home, which they call the Porterhouse Christmas Family Cafe. They set up a table in the living room with music in the background, and her husband dresses up as the server. Sometimes the kids dress up too. They have a special menu they can order from with Christmassy menu items and special things they don't get all the time, like hot chocolate and juice, and everyone loves how much fun this is. They still laugh about the time their then three-year-old, who didn't quite understand the breakfast menu, happily ordered french fries when asked what she wanted, and one time her husband accidentally spilled chocolate milk on their eight-year-old's head. Kara Farnsworth and her extended family also celebrate Christmas at him. They have a big Grinch-themed feast every year. This year they're planning a big group service project, too. Last year, Hilary Hess decided to set aside an entire Saturday in December for a Christmas movie marathon. In their jammies, of course. So, when they watched Christmas Vacation, they drank eggnog, but they decided to forego the extra dry turkey. They ate cookies and drank hot chocolate for the Santa Claus. In between movies, they sang Christmas songs like The Carolers and Christmas with the Cranks, and they ate spaghetti for lunch in honor of Elf. Maple syrup and sprinkles were optional. And of course, they balanced it out with some fruit and veggie trays. 
She blogs at helpingofhappiness.com and has a podcast by that name as well. Araba Joy has so many wonderful and simple Christmas traditions that it's hard to choose which ones to share. Here are three, and you can read more about them and other great traditions at arabajoy.com. I'll link that as well. The first is a snowflake cutting competition. It's as simple as it sounds, and you end up with pretty decorations. The second is the Christmas Eve box. They wrap a box and open it together on Christmas Eve. It includes a new game for the family to play, pajamas, snacks, and sometimes even a coupon for a Christmas camp out by the tree. The third one is a Christmas story scavenger hunt. Armed with a Bible and the fabulous guide that Araba created, her kids figure out the clues and gather objects around the house. For example, one clue says, read Luke chapter 2 verse 6, and then find something small and warm like the material in this verse. You can download the clues for free on her blog, arabajoy.com. I'll link to that in my show notes too. Before the 1st of December, Beth chooses 25 Christmas books, wraps them up, and then they read one every night leading up to Christmas. Kristen Steele also has a Christmas book tradition. She buys a new Christmas picture book for the family each year, glues that year's Christmas card onto the front cover, and writes about some of the highlights of the year. Now let's talk Christmas Eve. Several years ago, I realized that I was kind of dreading Christmas Eve. We always had a fancy candlelit dinner, put on a Christmas pageant with the kids, opened their Christmas pajamas, somehow got our overstimulated children to bed, and then still had hours of work to go. It was all fun, but so much work that I was too exhausted to really enjoy it. I realized that of all those traditions, the food prep was the most work and the least memorable. So we started a new tradition. Our Christmas Eve dinner is now a simple shepherd's pie and an angel food cake. It's symbolic, with both the shepherds and angels represented, but it's also simple and I can make it all the day before. It's a nice humble meal so we can focus on the rest of the night's festivities and maybe even get to bed before 1 a.m. Rachel Dahl does a themed dinner as well, a Bethlehem dinner. Basically, a charcuterie tray with things that they would have eaten in Bethlehem at the time of Christ. Things like pita, hummus, grapes, dates, goat cheese, etc. After dinner, her girls exchange sibling gifts, they act out the nativity and sing, and then they go to bed. Now that her girls are older, they also spend the day of Christmas Eve skiing. They have the slopes pretty much to themselves, and it gets them in the Christmas spirit to be out in the snow. Molly Liggett spends Christmas Eve with her husband's family for fondue and a favorite things gift exchange. Everybody wraps their favorite thing and they choose a gift white elephant style. The kids get matching PJs and a book from their grandparents and they act out the nativity and try to get home early. Which brings us to Christmas morning. Siri has a great tradition to bring in the true meaning of Christmas before the frenzy of gifts. So usually it's around seven and they'll come wake us up and then we usually get on our bed as a family. They all just kind of jump on our bed and get under the covers because it's super cold. And my husband already has like on an iPad or sometimes screen shared to the TV is to watch um, like a Luke 2 video, the birth of the Savior and kind of their journey to Bethlehem and leading up to that. So we always like try to make sure that we have that spirit of Christmas and the reason why we're celebrating it in our forefront mind, right? And be part of our day before we get to the, you know, the commercialization of Christmas. We usually have like a family prayer together. And so it's just really fun because sometimes I think we forget about like the true meaning, especially right then. And I really feel like it helps then again, bring in that gratitude and that ability to really be thankful for the presents that are before them and for the people that bought them for them and the creativity and, you know, all of that. Beth's Christmas starts a little earlier. My mom and dad would make us wait till five o'clock to open presents, which was like the latest, like 5 a.m. I can't sleep that long. So I'd like get up at three and wake up my siblings and we could go out and look through our stockings, but we couldn't open any gifts. So I always remember doing that. And I love that. And all of those traditions I've carried on into my family. Like Danny still brings me in a gift at 3 a.m. when I wake up and I'm like, I can't wait, bring me a present. So do you wake up before your kids? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, usually, I usually wake up, open a present, and then go back to sleep. And then they come in and wake me up. Often I've had to wake them up because I've been like, it is 6 a.m. Are you kidding me, children? You are two years old. You're old enough. Let's go. Wake up, baby. So I have had to wake them up many times. But after all the presents are unwrapped, Christmas Day can be kind of a letdown. Merrily Boyack was definitely feeling this. So when her kids were older, she started a new tradition. This clip is from the Helping of Happiness podcast by Hilary Hess. When the kids got older, uh, we gave them uh, $100 at Thanksgiving, each of them. And they were then required to go out and um, spend that money, donate it, and do something good with it. And then Christmas evening 
when we came back, uh, you know, in the evening together, um, each of them would share what they had done with the money. Oh, and that's holy cow, that was, you know, it's hard sometimes to keep our older children and our teenagers uh, kind of engaged, shall we yeah. say? Yeah. Um, that was remarkable. Oh, the first year just gave me goosebumps. It was so precious. So that's precious. neat. Which brings us to our last Christmas topic for the day, and probably the most important one, giving service. Perhaps there's no better way to teach our kids the true meaning of Christmas than serving others. Beth has been incorporating Secret Santa into her family Christmas tradition since college. Secret Santa is kind of like, to me, the biggest part of Christmas anymore. There's still so many traditions. I mean, I mentioned a bunch, and there's, that's like a small window. I always loved Christmas, and, but it became like more tender to me, I guess. In college, when our church leader asked a group of us to do Secret Santa for a family, and he really encouraged us to give more than we could. So he's like, so if you have 20 bucks, give them 40. If you can spend $50, try to spend 100. And he just really encouraged us to like spend more than you think you can. And I remember all of us being so poor and eating tuna. Oh my gosh, the amount of tuna I ate in college was disturbing because I was giving plasma. Oof, iron was very important. Anyways, I ate so much tuna, was so poor. And I remember all of us going to the store and being like, okay, well, we have $100 in our account. So we'll all give like 30. Okay, everyone cool with 30. And then we got to the store and we're like, okay, should we all just go ahead and max out our debit cards? Yes. So like we all just spent every penny we had and got this family Christmas and went in the back of the truck and dropped it on their doorstep and ran away. And I just remember that Christmas meaning so much more. Because if you just like, if I have, if I have a whole fridge full of food and I give someone a couple of cans, it doesn't matter, you know? But if you have only a couple of things in your fridge and you still give, I just think it means so much more to like that, that sacrifice. I love taking my kids to the store, especially when it's like, when I'm taking my seven-year-old and saying, okay, now choose everything you would love for another seven-year-old. And it's like that conflict of, but I want all these things and I'm going to buy all of them and give them away. And it's like, I don't know, something about that experience of having it hurt just a little bit. I think they remember it more. Lori Brescia takes a different spin on Secret Santa. They do a secret service Santa within their own family. This started as a way to help her kids build better relationships with each other and also to take the focus away from themselves during Christmas. They all draw names each year, and then throughout all the month of December, they do small acts of service for one another as secretly as possible. Sometimes the drawing is random, and other times Lori rigged the drawing when one kid was having trouble with another specific child. Some of the service the kids do for each other includes making beds and cleaning rooms, doing somebody's laundry, cleaning their room, making breakfast and having it ready at their spot at the kitchen table when they wake up, foot rubs, dollar store toys on their pillows, drawings and handmade gifts, the lunch packed and in the fridge before school, doing one of their chores before they wake up, helping with homework, baking them a special treat, listening to them talk about their day, or just offering words of comfort and encouragement. And here's another great service idea from Siri. Another thing that our family always does every year um, is called, they're called hobo bags. And the HOBO stands for helping others before ourselves. And it was created by one of my friends. She actually had a, a brother that passed away um, from a mental illness. And there was a time when he was living on the streets. And in his will, he left money and asked them that they would create this tradition of creating hobo bags. And so we put like toothpaste and, you know, some snacks and socks and gloves. And I'm trying to get chapstick toothbrush, things of that nature. And then we just go downtown Salt Lake around here and we pass out the bags and some hot chocolate to those people that are in need. And my kids really look forward to doing that every year. I think it's their favorite part of Christmas. So what kind of response have you gotten when you've handed them out? They're always super grateful. They, a lot of times they're always trying to like pass it out to somebody else or they need this or they need it more. Or like they'll see that somebody is be on the other side of the park or down the street a little bit and they'll go tell them all, Oh, they've got hot chocolate. You know, it's nice and warm. They do this. And I don't, what I love the most is that they're really protective and really, really make sure that everyone around them is getting some even before they will take it. Like they will always pass their bag first. I love all these ideas about getting our kids out and serving. 
For the last several years, the church I belong to, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, has done a Light the World campaign with an Advent calendar full of daily service ideas for people of any denomination. I'll link to this year's calendar in my notes. I want to end this episode with a sweet clip from another episode of the Helping of Happiness podcast, in which Hillary interviews the wonderful Paula Wood. Once her kids were old enough not to pull all the ornaments off her tree, Paula decided to get another tree besides the family one with all the kids' ornaments, a pretty tree that she would decorate with a collection of nativity ornaments. Her kids called it the Jesus tree. Three weeks before Christmas, I decided to put, um, I had a little baby that looked like a real baby, and I wrapped it in a white towel, and I put it in a basket by the tree with fake grass, and it looked like hay. And that was baby Jesus because it was the baby Jesus tree. Well, about two days after I had put this baby there, one of my little daughters came to me and she said, Mom, the Jesus tree makes me sad now. Oh. And I said, why? Why does it make you sad? And she said, because all of the presents are down by our family tree. And it's not our birthday. It's his birthday. And he has no presence. This is not right. And it makes me sad. Every time I look at the baby, it makes me sad. He has no presence. <laughs> That's the that, sweetest thing I've ever heard. Isn't that so sweet? And I just, I almost cried right there. I go, oh my gosh, you're right. This is horrible. <laughs> you know, it was. I mean, I felt it because she was really distressed. And I'm going, oh, that's, that's so, that's so bad. And I said, well, what should we do? And she goes, I don't know. What should we do, mom? I go, I don't know either. I said, well, why don't you, you think about it and we'll pray about it and you think about it and I will. And tomorrow after school, let's see if we can think up something by then. So we always did scripture reading at night. So we did our scripture reading around the Jesus tree. And um, then the kids, we tucked them in and I went back to the tree and I sat there and I looked at the tree and I, I just, I started praying. I go, Heavenly Father, this is your child who came to me with this really, really very insightful, profound question. And I don't know what to do. And I, it's your son's birthday. And what should we do? How, how should I handle this to honor her sensitivity, the savior, and this opportunity to really make something important for my family? What should I do? And since we just read scriptures, my scriptures were sitting there. And I opened them up and I opened them up to Matthew 25, 34 through 40. And it says, for I was in hunger and you gave me meat. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. Naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came unto me. And then they said to him, Lord, when was thou in hunger and thou gave me meat? Or when was thou thirsty and gave thee drink? When, you know, through all those things. And then he said, inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. And I go, oh, there's an idea. So the next day I went and I found six boxes and I wrapped them in gold paper and I found gold gift tags and I wrote naked and you clothed me on one, sick and you visited me on one, imprisoned and you came unto me on one. Each one of those things I wrote on a tag and I wrapped the presents and I put them on the other side of the room away from the tree. Well, the kids came home from school and they're going, what are those presents? Are those for us? Can we have them? What are they for? And then I took my little daughter aside and I said, were you able to think of something to do? She goes, no, I couldn't think of anything, mom. I couldn't think of anything. And I said, well, here's my plan. And I told her about my reading the scriptures that night. And, and I said, my idea is in the scriptures, he told us what he wants. He wants us to, to clothe the naked and he wants us to feed the people that are hungry and give people water and, and go to see, you know, help people in prison and and that's what he said. When we do it for them, it's like doing it for him. And she goes, oh, can we do all those things? Can we do all those things? And I said, well, it'll be hard to do them in three weeks, but I think we can figure out a way. So, so we decided together that we would, we wrote one of those things on each, a little sheet of paper and folded it up and put it in a bowl. And then after scripture reading, we each pulled one out. And whatever we pulled out, it was our responsibility to think of a family activity we could do to represent that gift. And after we did the gift, we take the present over from where it was and gave it to the baby and put it by the tree. And so that was in 1989. And we have done that activity every year since then as a family. We have had amazing experiences. The children would choose to go through their clothes or their toys and give to a family in need. We did Secret Santa. We did um, 12 Days of Christmas, which was really, really fun. 
but what happened to our family was our concentration started being on planning those activities and and doing them together and the memories of doing them together and now honestly when i look at the baby or i listen to christmas music and i look at the baby by the tree he's so real he's so real and my grandkids come in and they pick up the baby and they love the baby and they take care of the baby when they're at my house it really has helped our family to have a more christ-centered serving attitude and i i see that extending beyond christmas in a way that's very powerful it doesn't need to be complicated at all it can be very simple but it it just is a way to help focus on him and and literally giving him things in the way he asked in as much as you've done it unto the least of these you've done it unto me thank you for listening to the how she moms podcast if you like it tell a friend the bigger the community the more ideas There are lots of ways you can add your ideas to the How She Moms community. We have a new Facebook group where we share ideas about upcoming topics and help each other solve problems we're facing in motherhood. You can also follow How She Moms on Instagram for quick tips and ideas. And you can go to howshemoms.com where you'll find transcripts of episodes and lots of other great resources. Special thanks to my mom, Susan Singley, for recording my theme music. She played this song all the time when I was growing up, and to me, it's the soundtrack of motherhood.